Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for a book haul. Look, if you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. Poetry on Mondays, short stories once in a while. Right now we have a read-along of Fairy Tale by Stephen King. I don't know where my book is at. Uh, Fairy Tale by Stephen King on Thursdays. I think Thursdays are going to continue to be the day that I have a novel read-along, and we have in this very book haul the next read-along that I will be doing. And maybe one other one. Now, two things I want to say real quick. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing I talk about, so consider hitting the subscribe button. If you want to help me out reaching more people with literature, hitting the like button does the trick and I don't remember what the other thing was, but we're going to go ahead and get into the book haul. So the first book that I got, I don't do book hauls a lot. That's what it was. I don't do book hauls a lot because I'm not really, look, I've got all the books. I really believe in rereadability. I've got all the books that I would need to get through an entire lifetime in this very apartment. Plus the fact I'm going to be moving in a year or two so I'm already, my back is already aching at the thought of moving all of these books. When I moved in this apartment, there wasn't so much gray in this beard. Now, well, now there is. The first book I want to talk about, Hauntology by Mark Payne. Uh, this is a book that I will be going through on my personal channel, a link to which can be found in the description below. I've got a goal to hit a thousand subscribers on there this year. Help me out. Um, hauntology is, um, well, we'll just read from the back of the book. Jacques Derrida's Specters of Marx has had an enormous influence on recent thought about the fate of human capabilities in late capitalism, especially in Europe. There's some extenuating circumstances there. But hauntology explores a road not taken in Specters of Marx, the idea that shame is the route by which we access the capabilities for living that are abrogated in modernity. More particularly still, the book considers the loss of the new world as an horizon in which these abrogated capabilities were still in play, and the inhabitants of the new world as presenting forms of life before which Europeans felt shame in comparison with their own. Finally, the book discusses what might take place uh what might take the place of the new world now that it is productive now that its productive horizon of shame has receded from view i find hauntology an extremely interesting idea i have done some reading on mark payne but not of mark payne the reading that I have done on Mark Payne says that he is the sort of, um, he was the heir apparent to Derrida in terms of hauntology, in that he took the work that Derrida did, which was more broadly focused, and he took it in terms of the cultural zeitgeist if that makes any sense i'm not sure that it does i will be talking about this on my personal channel i have a couple video essays in in the works but when you look at the give me one second here the titles of the essays here one the shame of life two greeks indians and the weird tale and three Autarky, and The Incoherent Care. Th I was hoping this was a little bit more of a substantial book. I was hoping that these... So I had done some reading about these as essays. I did not know that they were essays in... They're not really brief essays. As this, if you get here, they are each 27 pages long, uh, about... 20 pages long, 23 pages long, and then the final essay is just 10 pages long. But I was hoping that this was more of the ilk of the next author I'm going to talk about. Uh, but these are ideas that I want to sort of contend with because 
On my personal channel, I am getting into ideas of hauntology and nihilism, and I think nihilism gets a bad rap, and I am not sure hauntology... Um, I'm not sure hauntology really sort of grows out of nihilism in the way that I think it is portrayed by ontologists, or maybe Mark Payne might have been the only ontologist, at least as far as I can tell through research on the idea, but there are certainly plenty of people who have given wax at the idea. Um, though not exclusively what their career was was sort of made out of. Mark Payne really sort of grew a career out of um, the studies of ontology. Uh, the, the book in itself is titled Ontology, Depressive Anthropology and the Shame of Life. So I think that there is, um, I think that there are a lot of overlaps between the nihilistic tendencies as society has painted them, but not necessarily the nihilistic tendencies as nihilism is in practice. Yeah, I think that's right. So, the next book that I have here in this book haul comes to us from Robert Greene. Power from Robert Greene. Robert Greene, um... The Laws of Human Nature, I do not have. Mastery, I do have. The 33 Strategies of War, I do have. And now I have Power. Also, he wrote The Daily Laws, which is his new one. I think so. Um, the Daily Stoic Guy, Ryan Holiday, learned from Robert Greene. Reached out to Robert Greene when he was younger and still working on things. And then wrote The Daily Stoic. The Daily Stoic blew up, I think. If you read some of Robert Greene's stuff, I think Robert Greene became jealous of that and decided to write a daily reader of his own. Um, and I, I, am, I assume it's very good because all of Robert Greene's stuff is extremely high quality. But I do not have a seduction either. The, something, the, the Art of Seduction is the name of the book. But Power... I have listened to the audiobook of this... I am just getting the book, so I did not have the chance to read it. Uh, but when I am feeling down and out, I will grab Mastery once in a while, read some excerpts from Mastery, and feel even worse about myself. But if I grab the 33 Strategies of War, I feel like I can conquer. Power, the 48 Laws of Power, as it were, uh, is a book very much like the 33 Strategies of War, but it is in its own way, ironically, empowering. So when you just read the chapter titles, chapter one, never out, law one, is that, is that your title? Law one, never outshine the master. Law two, never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use enemies. Law 3. Conceal your intentions. Law 4. Always say less than necessary. Law 5. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. This is an extremely useful book. This, uh, so he also had one called the 50th Law, which is sort of his mini-biography of 50 Cent, the rapper 50 Cent, the, the mogul. 50 Cent. And a lot of the impressive things that 50 Cent has done. And it, it's a really interesting book, too. There is an audiobook for that one, which includes little bits from 50 himself. And extremely, extremely interesting. Now, the reason that these books, I think, are so useful is not um, in taking advantage of people or anything like that, but it's in these situations present themselves in all facets of life. Now, all facets of life, you have to learn how to apply them. So what he does, Robert Greene, in his books is present an idea 
and use examples from history and how they are to be applied and interpreted. So never outshine the master. This is a broadly applicable law. It can apply to many different situations in your life. But the main one for most people that is going to provide use, you have to apply it to your place of work. Never make your boss look like an idiot. That sounds pretty useful. If you continually make your boss look like an idiot, they're not going to like you very much. Your boss doesn't like you very much. You don't get a whole lot of opportunities, right? So these little stratagem. Number, law 30, make your accomplishments seem effortless. Why would that be impossible? How do you, or why would that be necessary? How do you apply it to your daily life? Well, if you were competing with someone for a promotion and your boss sees you effortlessly doing things, A, they will think you are capable of more. B, your competition will assume those things need not be effortful. If they are not needed to be effortful, your opponent will attack these things haphazardly and probably fail. And guess what? In the eyes of the person doing the promoting, you effortlessly got through said task. Your opponent failed. Who is going to get that promotion. And I think that there are all sorts of these things that can... Um, so, for example, here on, on YouTube, do you want to see how stressful it is for me to set up this phone and have to hit the record? I don't like being... I don't like being recorded. Do I need to put that out there? How often I sit here for 30 minutes or so before hitting the record button. I don't need to make this video. I don't have anything important to say. I don't have anything compelling to talk about. I don't have any reason to put myself out there on the internet talking about a short story or a poem or a novel. I don't have any want to actually be in front. No, it, it doesn't do you any good to see that. You would probably click away. I would click away if there was a uh, content creator who constantly just complained about how hard it was to turn on the camera and, and start talking. I wouldn't enjoy that. I don't think many people would. So if you make it look effortless, it is much easier for an audience and creator interaction. It is much easier for whatever it is that I am talking about in the video to be um, understandable, right? If, if I turn on the camera and I him haw about how difficult it is for me to start talking, then all of the other stuff that I'm talking about just gets lost. The next book. So that is the, maybe, once I get better, and so here I'm going to go ahead and break that 30th law, right? But once I get better with editing and stuff, I am going to start presenting ideas from the Robert Green books on my personal channel. The personal channel is where I talk about philosophy, movie reviews, goal setting, nonfiction in general, things like that. That all sort of filters into the personal channel. So again, if you're interested in things like that, hit that uh, link in the description box. Go over there and consider subscribing there as well. The next book I have here is not the next book that I will be reading along, but I think it would make sense to do a read-along for this at some point in time. Jurassic Park. By Michael Crichton. Now, Michael Crichton probably as much as is as much to blame as any author for why I'm here right now. Maybe Emily Dickinson more because Emily Dickinson found me and and pulled me into the idea of literature during a time where I was very impressionable, but as far as stories and novels, Michael Crichton was the original novelist with which I fell in love. Michael, I remember where I was when I found out Michael Crichton died. I was in the computer library at Maple Woods Community College, and I used to get 
emails from, I think it was CNN. I used to get CNN emails. And uh, an email came in that Michael Crichton had died. I remember that. I remember that. And um, when I was in middle school, I absolutely fell in love with Michael Crichton. I read Sphere. I read Jurassic Park. I think I read the second Jurassic Park. I think that was in the, I think that's in the right time space. I read Timeline when it came out my freshman year in high school, I think. Freshman or sophomore. I read, okay, so Sphere, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park 2, Eaters of the Dead. I tried to read Congo, couldn't get into it. I tried to read something else, couldn't get into it. Um, and then I read the one about the plague that comes back from space. I can't remember what it's called right now. But anyway, Michael Crichton was my original love as a novelist in 6th and 7th grade. Um, Michael Crichton, what Michael Crichton is really good at doing is taking two ideas, mashing them together, and then sort of pulling something original out of the goo. Here we have the idea of cloning which was, when was my, was this like 1990, I think that this was written? 1990, yeah. Copyright 1990. The idea of cloning didn't really take off until 98, I think, a sheep was cloned. And all the way back in 1990, Michael Crichton was enough, was up enough on the science to know we're going to be able to do this stuff. So he took cloning, and he took chaos theory, and he mashed them together. And then, you know, when you start thinking about cloning and you start thinking about chaos theory, what would be a great tool with which to tell those scientific conundrums? Well, dinosaurs. That'd be pretty cool, right? Uh, so that is really what Michael Crichton is incredibly good at. In Sphere, it was time travel, the scientific idea of time travel. And religiosity, I think, was really what it was. It was my favorite book for years. I read it two or three times, I think, in middle school. Uh, two or three times between the sixth and seventh grade. And I think I read it again in high school. But um, I have since forgotten a little bit about... 20 years ago, guys. Um, more than that now. But... What he's able to do with the ideas that he's smashing together and then bring out some incredibly insightful stuff. Um, I've never read anyone else like it. And again, he was tip of the top with research, with um, cutting edge science. That is what Michael Crichton was really good for. So a lot of it, you're, you're talking more hard science fiction than soft science fiction. If you're saying soft science fiction is like Kurt Vonnegut, Kurt Vonnegut, Ice Nine, uh, what happens if you can, if freezing is the slowing of molecules, what happens if you're able to stop those molecules? And if those molecules stop, why would the molecules next to them keep going? The Kurt Vonnegut took very, um, took scientific concepts and sort of ran with them. Whereas um, Michael Crichton took the actual research papers and ran with them. So th that is sort of the difference between the Michael Crichtons and the Kurt Vonnegut's. Um, but yeah, at, at some point, probably I will have read-alongs for Michael Crichton on the channel, but they will probably be more like the fairy tale and the Shining read-alongs that, that I've done on the channel versus, for example, the next book that I'm going to get into on this. You know what, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, the next book that I have here the next book I have here, I have no idea how to, to, how to say the author's name, but Osamu Datsai no longer human. This was sort of coincidentally when I went to the Barnes and Noble on a display. 
I had never heard of this author. But I started reading the back of the book, portraying himself as a failure. The protagonist of Osamu Tetsai's No Longer Human narrates a seemingly normal life even while he feels himself incapable of understanding human beings. It's like I was made to read this book. Obayozo's attempts to reconcile himself to the world around him begin in early childhood, continue through high school where he becomes a, quote, clown, end quote, to mask his alienation, and eventually lead to a failed suicide attempt as an adult. Without sentimentality, he records the casual cruelties of life and its fleeting moments of human connection and tenderness. This is the next book that I will be doing as a read-along. You are getting it here before I do an announcement video or episode one. But what I will do is I will break this down on a... It is so... It is sort of... I think there are three notebooks. Three or four notebooks. It's a little bit... is broken up a little bit differently. So this is the third notebook, part two. I think that that's it. Uh, there are three notebooks, but one has a part two. So there, it's going to be a little bit. It's going to be a little bit uneven as far as the reading, the reading not assignments, but the reading portions of the book go. But I will have again the series broken down into sort of what happened, and then literary discussion, and then. Um, writer's notes, but I am considering doing this as the first, what I want to call, Black Label series on the channel. I was hoping to have something a little bit um, more expressly written, something with shorter chapters and things to start off with in order to sort of wet my feet with the process, but there's going to be a little bit more that goes into the Black Label series on the channel. I want to get into things where I'm doing Black Label read-alongs, Black Label reviews, Black Label short story, dis uh, short story reviews, Black Label poetry reviews. Uh, they're going to be a bit more of an undertaking. I started a different Black Label series, and it's just too much work for what it is right now. So I will eventually get back to that once I have figured out a way to parse the plate, I think, is maybe the best way to put it. But um, yeah, again, just shortly, Mark Payne Hauntology. This is going to be going into uh, video essays on my personal channel, a link to which can be found in the description below. Go over there, check me out there, and consider subscribing there as well. Um, 48 Laws of Power from Robert Greene. If I figure out a little bit more about video editing, these will go over there as well. Michael Crichton Jurassic Park will get its own series on the channel eventually, and so will No Longer Human, Osamu Dazai. De Dazai. Someone tell me how to say that name so I don't sound like an idiot. Every week while going through the read-along, I will just sound like an idiot now. But those are the books that I have for this um, book haul. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button. Uh, literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. I talk about poetry, short stories, and novels, and if occasionally a flash fiction or two. And um, if you want to help me out with what I'm doing here on this channel to reach more people in the crusade to spread literature, consider hitting the like button. And I hope to have you back for the next video.